and Hayden fishery, which is a, plays a critical role. The, the Menhaden species play a critical role in the ecosystem of Chesapeake Bay, and the General Assembly has reserved the right to regulate that species and that fishery. Um, so now they're forced with making some decisions about how to do that. Peggy's going to tell us the story and tell us how we can uh, help make a difference in supporting sound science in the man management of this important species. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for um, being here. This is actually really, I said to Nathan beforehand, it's really um, gratifying. Uh, that you're here doing work and being interested in, in knowing what's going to happen uh, in the next month and thereafter. Um, many of you uh, have been following some Menhaden related issues over the last several years, and it, it's exactly what uh, Nathan said. Now the chickens have come home to roost, as a couple of uh, legislators have specifically said. Um, the question is, um, is Virginia going to live up to its obligation under its compact and under federal law to actually manage the fishery? Uh, there is evidence, we'll talk a little bit about it more later on, of uh, severely declining Menhaden populations. Virginia's delegates now to the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission are, even as we speak, we hope, dreaming about it, thinking about it, and working hard to uh, come up with a plan. Uh, and uh, on December 14, the commission uh, will uh, issue what we think will be new limits and management measures for, for Manhattan. So can Virginia actually do what it needs to do to get it done? I think everyone knows that Manhattan has been uh, aptly called the most important fish in the sea. In fact, I walked into a legislator's office yesterday, and we hadn't opened our mouth when he said, I know, the most important fish in the sea. But it is. <laughs> um, a small, oily fish, a story of history. We've heard it's part of the lore that it was a Menhaden that was uh, the per that provided the fertilizer uh, at Plymouth Colony to make the corn grow. Um, uh, wisdom uh, provided to them, we understand, from uh, Native Americans in the area. I'm not sure if that's true. But in any event, we do know that it uh, fulfills very important environmental uh, roles. It is forage for fisheries that people care about and that are critical to the life of the bay. Striped bass, bluefish, summer flounder, wheat fish, marine animals, uh, seabirds like ospreys, pelicans, and blues. It feeds on plankton, helping to filter the water. It is a critical uh, fish for the bay. Um, and here's just a couple of representations, obviously a photo of the fish, a depiction of the fish, um, and just keep this picture in mind at the bottom. This is one stage in a uh, important method that Virginia, and only Virginia, uses to capture um, uh, 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 Manhattan for the reduction fishery. Two boats, nets circling the school. It's very efficient. We'll hear more about it. Uh, its role in the food chain, I think, is uh, exemplified by uh, this slide. Uh, you see that it is it's linked to striped bass, critically important component of the striped bass diet. Historically, I understand from our scientists that it has comprised something like 70% of the of the striped bass diet. As we'll see, this has gone down. Uh, when um, Manhattan, when striped bass, I understand, uh, can't get sufficient Manhattan, they tend to prey more on other fisheries we care about, such as the blue crab fishery. It's all connected. We know uh, the story of, of this interconnected food chain from when we were uh, in elementary school, but it is Manhattan in the bay and along the coast, which arguably, arguably <coughs> plays the most important role in that chain um, in our area. Two important fisheries actually comprise the Manhattan fishery. Um, the reduction fishery, based primarily and indeed exclusively, really, in Reedville, Virginia, uh, epitomized by a company, Omega Protein, a publicly traded business, uh, which has something like uh, 10, uh, we call them purse stain vessels. That, that's part of the process that we saw earlier depicted. Uh, each of the larger vessels, a mother boat, I've heard them referred to, has two boats that encircle the schools. They purse the same, and then they vacuum up the fish. That's what's going on there. As I said, very efficient. Uh, in 2010, um, more than 183,000 metric tons were harvested from Virginia waters and coastal uh, areas. 
This is an, a significant increase over prior years, 20%, 27% over the 29, uh, 2009 catch, 19% even over the four years average uh, catch. Uh, yeah. And so it's not something uh, that we see the company taking an active role to, to reduce. Uh, it's important in um, commerce in fertilizer, fish meal, uh, pet food, fish oil, and so forth. It's everywhere or they would like it to be everywhere. Um, but it's not all. While that was at 80% of the fishery, the, the balance has been about 20% the bait fishery. Manhattan used as bait for, we mentioned, blue crabs, bait for uh, lobsters in, in the northern areas and other fisheries, uh, sport fisheries, bluefish obviously, all along the coast, not concentrated in one geographic area or one state. Uh, as the uh, reduction fishery is. Um, again, a sizable industry, uh, more than uh, 43,000 metric tons were taken from the bait fishery uh, in 2010. Again, that uh, number shows an increase over prior years. This uh, gives you some sense of the relative size of the two fisheries, again, uh, uh, over the years from 1985 to 2007. Throughout that time, of course, the reduction fishery has been the largest uh, component, but the, uh, the bait fishery still plays a very big role economically and otherwise. Who controls this? Well, we know the federal government has exclusive authority over uh, the what they call the economics, the exclusive economic zone from three miles out to 200 miles offshore. And states generally uh, retain authorities over the fisheries within their territorial waters. For example, the bay, the, uh, the within three miles uh, area off the coast. But Manhattan don't stay in one state, even in Virginia. Um, this is an old slide. Actually, it's from 1973, but it represents uh, the kind of migrational patterns that you see this fish takes. Obviously, up from the south, from Florida all the way up the coast, don't ignore the little stop off in the bay, um, and, and the, the, the uh, traveling is um, reversed uh, in the fall and winter. This slide, again from uh, 2005, uh, is, was de designed to show um, different ages of fish being caught in different places. But I'm using it to show uh, also the extent to which the Manhattan fishery is concentrated in Virginia. It's, it's interjurisdictional, but it's a big deal in Virginia economically, directly, and indirectly. So keep that in mind that the, the red dots, which take up the preponderance, are uh, two year old uh, Manhattan, and the blue are three. So, concentrated in Virginia, how does Virginia regulate this? Well, unlike every other fishery, unlike every other fishery in Virginia, it's the General Assembly that regulates it. It does so by, by statute, and obviously that's extremely cumbersome and inefficient, uh, and this is where, this is why the fish have, the, the chickens have come home to roost, or the chickens to their spawning lands, whatever. Um, it is hard for the, the members of the General Assembly who have many responsibilities to become sufficiently expert in fishery science, really to know what they're doing. And I say that with all due respect. I spent a fair amount of time this fall trying to um, be an apprentice at the feet of my scientist colleagues, and I know that it's not easy, and I've had more time than the legislators uh, have. Uh, nonetheless, that's the way we do it in Virginia. Uh, and you can find in, in the statute, for example, uh, there is a provision that sets the annual harvest cap on Manhattan in the Bay. That's written in the code, 109,000 um, metric tons. There's another provision that sets the fishing season, states the fishing grounds. Um, how do we know uh, if they've reached their annual cap, well, the reduction of fishery uh, is, uh, must report its daily catch to the National Marine Fisheries Service, who then will notify the governor if the cap is ever reached. Keep in mind, the existing cap on Manhattan in the Bay is much higher than um, Omega has uh, reached in the last several years, so it could be argued that it is a meaningless cap, but that's another issue. Um, 
if the General Assembly uh, doesn't uh, do what it needs to do in terms of uh, bringing in um, federal limits, which we'll talk about in a minute, the governor does have a brief window uh, after the session closes and before the season starts when uh, he can implement emergency measures to manage the mandating. It's, very, it's a very short window. It, even if he does something, it will only uh, be in place until the General Assembly comes back into session. And note that his statutory responsibility is not just to rest on scientific and biological evidence, in other words, the health of the fishery, but also the governor is by statute charged to take into account economic and social data and information. So I would submit to you the governor's responsibility is, um, I mean, it's a serious one, and he, by, by statute, is obligated to take into account considerations of jobs in Reedville uh, and, and other economic data. So that's, the Virgin that's a brief synopsis of what's going on in Virginia, but we do have a, a federal component. Um, and and uh, I'm referring to the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. Uh, it is an interstate compact, which is formed by all of the Atlantic states, 15 states. It was formed in the late 40s. It was blessed by Congress, slightly amended in 1950. It's a compact which is, has got constitutional uh, basis. Uh, and it's designed, as its, its constituent documents say, to ensure the better utilization of fisheries and to promote and protect them and to prevent the physical waste by any cause. Those are, you know, that's language obviously very broad. It's language from the 40s. It probably wouldn't be written quite in the same way this, uh, at this time. 15 member states, as I mentioned, each state has three representatives, and uh, those representatives <coughs> must be the state's marine fisheries director in Virginia. That, that's the director of the uh, commissioner at BMRC, Jack Travelstead, who's an extremely competent um, scientist. A state legislature, uh, Richard Stewart, is the uh, current uh, ASMFC member. He, his uh, district historically had included uh, Reedville, uh, the, but due to redistricting, uh, it's not in his uh, jurisdiction right now. Uh, and there is a public member appointed by the governor. Those three vote, those three individuals together need to, they have one vote when the commission meets. Uh, so you can see here that um, Certainly the, the, the uh, administration of Virginia has a strong voice in determining how Virginia will vote. What, does, um, what do the members do? Uh, well, by, by, uh, by their compact, they are to recommend legislation, uh, and they are to develop fishery management plans, which I've referred to here as FMPs, for, uh, for each of the relevant uh, fisheries. Um, the compact is written in very general terms. It's been adopted as part of the Virginia Code. Uh, and, and I will say it reserves some significant power to the state. Uh, and, and for example, it says it does not limit the power of any signatory state to repeal and prevent legislation, and I'm skipping down, to conserve <coughs> its fisheries. So there, there is a lot of state power. Um, but the state need, if it's going to exercise that power, even under the compact, it's got to be uh, for conserving its fisheries, I would argue. Um, it's by compact, it is not strictly speaking a regulatory agency. And all of the states, Maine to Florida, um, they have their own interpretation of what this means. And historically, they exercised that, that right to interpret it in a variety of different ways, inconsistent regulation, is what resulted to such a degree that even Congress, back in 1993, was forced to acknowledge that we had big problems in managing our fisheries. And it enacted some legislation I referred to as the Cooperative Management Act, which um, was designed to give the commission some real teeth. And it did so because it said the fisheries are depleted. They're depleted because of increasing fishery for, uh, fishing pressure, environmental pollution, loss of habitat, and so forth. It said there is a problem when you don't have an exclusive management authority. You get inconsistent regulation, and you, you unfairly distribute the conservation burdens. So if you have, as we do now, 
Maryland as one example, which says we're not going to have per se fishery, uh, per se fishing of Manhattan, and Virginia allows it, you can see that the burden of conservation falls unequally on Maryland uh, fishermen and Virginia fishermen. That's just one example. So this act was designed to give ASMFC more teeth, and states are required to implement uh, the program. Um, I won't go through the details here, but I, I, I want to look at the last bullet point, which says that states are required to implement and enforce um, the fishery management plan that the AS, ASMFC authorizes. The statute went further and said, okay states, if you don't know what implement and enforce means, we'll tell you. It means enact and implement laws or regulations as required to conform state law to the management plan. I would tell you, in my view, that's very strong language. So, let's move over to what currently governs uh, the uh, Manhattan in uh, Virginia. In 1981, there was a, the original fishery management plan, uh, and it was pretty bare bones. It basically talked about you have to have a certain number of your fish that are three years old. In other words, three years is, is, a, is a way that I, remember, non-scientist, uh, uh, conceive of the spawning population, the population that's actually going to give rise to the ability to sustain the population. In 1991, it was amended, amendment number one, uh, and for a number of years thereafter, you can see in 04, 05, 06, and 09, that amendment was further modified by these various addenda. I only note these um, changes because you'll hear a lot of people talking about amendment, addenda. There's been a variety of ways uh, to, that, that the management has uh, been more refined over the last several years. Why has it been? It has been, and I'm just going to give you a few examples, amended because <coughs> stock assessments, which are required by ASMFC to be done on a periodic basis, have shown uh, increasingly uh, serious uh, pressures on the population of Manhattan. So, in, for example, in 2003, uh, while the ASMFC said, yeah, it's not overfished, there's no overfishing going on now, when this study went out for peer review, uh, the, the other scientists looked at it and said there is a concern that the way we're doing the stock assessment doesn't accurately capture what could happen where you have a concentrated industry like in the Bay. Um, maybe it's not getting all the data that we need to have. Moreover, in the last 10 years or so, we see more and more other ecological signs of problems in the Manhattan fisheries. So, for example, if you look at the numbers of fish, it looks like you're not having as many young fish joining the, the, the adult reproducing population of the Manhattan. And you see a whole series of problems in the striped bass population. And obviously, many things affect the health of a fish population. I'm not saying this is all Manhattan related, but you see smaller fish uh, reduced in weight to length. You see, as I mentioned earlier, a significant drop in the amount of Manhattan that you see in, in, um, in striped bass as part of their diet. I think the numbers are something like they went from 70 to 11 percent, something along those lines, a significant drop. Uh, and a reduced uh, survival rate of this fish, which is dependent historically on Manhattan. In 2010, uh, I, I bring this to your attention because there was a benchmark stock assessment, which means uh, a more thoroughgoing one. Again, this one was uh, peer-reviewed as well. And based on better, richer, and more complete data, um, the conclusion was this fishery has experienced overfishing for 32 of the last 54 years. It's a very significant finding. In other words, taking it into account, obviously, a lot of historical data. And there's extremely low recruitment. The population is at the lowest level since 1955. Scientists concluded that one of the things you need to do is you need to ensure that you conserve a larger percentage of the spawning stock. Uh, and uh, in, in 2011, 
um, a new uh, addendum to uh, then Amendment 1 was promulgated, uh, trying to come up with new reference points to capture the idea that, you know, when scientists estimate and model the health of a fishery, they have a lot of what they call reference points to, that show you, even though the population fluctu fluctuates over time, year to year, you know, you've got, to, you've got to have accurate enough reference points so that you can see if the population is on a downward trajectory. So they recommended new reference points. This is a slide that, in, in some ways, tells it all. Um, uh, you can see uh, a, a downward slide since 1985, uh, and, and that's we're kind of at the same levels uh, at, uh, from where this shows in 2007, 8, and 9. Lowest on record. Okay, so to address those pressures and that situation, which is um, threatening the abundance of this population, the ASMFC has, uh, is in the process of working on Amendment 2 to replace Amendment 1. Um, a draft was uh, sent out over the summer, uh, and ASMFC has been taking uh, comments on that, and they're expected to issue a final Amendment 2 on December 14 in Annapolis. Um, the draft itself doesn't say, for example, we recommend reducing the level by 25%. It's, it gives a number of options that the commission will decide on after careful consideration uh, on December 14. So I can't tell you what's in it specifically, but I will tell you that, as I mentioned, um, it will set new reference points trying to give scientists a better set of measurements to know when and how the fish is being managed and where, when you reach a danger level in the population. Uh, and it will recommend, we believe, a, for the first time, a coastwide Maine to Florida total allowable cap, uh, catch. In other words, a, a cap on how much, how many men you can take every year. Um, again, we don't know what that number will be, but um, based on the comments that we've seen that have been submitted to ASMFC, uh, there have been many uh, in the uh, conservation community, particularly who recommended a 50% reduction, and that would be 50% down from an average, for example, of the last five years or so. Um, we understand that Omega is suggesting a 10% cut. Omega, not surprisingly, is um, has serious um, objections to the data that is being used here. Uh, the Bay Foundation has recommended that a 25% cut uh, should be sufficient at, to be modified potentially over time as new data is taken in. So we don't know what will happen in terms of the final recommendation, but do look for a, a, a the commission adopting a reduction in the total harvest made to Florida. There'll be other management measures we anticipate will come. One that the Bay Foundation has recommended is that there be a specific allocation between how much the uh, reduction industry can take versus how much the, the uh, bait fishery can take. We're recommending 70 to 30, um, and that would, remember earlier, right now, Omega's taking 80 and the bait fishing is 20. So it's not a big reduction that we are, a big reduction that, that, that Omega would have. Again, we'll have to wait and see what the commission does. Okay, so on December 14, we're gonna have a plan. Then what has to happen? Um, the federal legislation says states shall enforce and implement the plan within the time frame that's established. We expect ASMFC to say you've got to comply within a year, probably with the first compliance date with the plan, July 1st. We don't know that for sure. But the state has an obligation to do so. ASMFC is then, once it's done, ASMFC and its member states will verify it. Is Virginia really doing it? Um, the state has lots of, lots of ability to challenge it, to appeal it. Um, but ultimately, um, the state has to enforce it. That's our position. And I think it's well supported by the law that applies. If Virginia does not adopt the management measures in Amendment 2, and if that refusal to adopt continues despite a number of internal appeals procedures, 
then ultimately the matter would go to the Secretary of Commerce, who has the responsibility to ensure um, that the management plan is enforced. Um, he's going to conduct his own independent review, he'll listen to what Virginia has to say, but if the Secretary concludes that Virginia is out of compliance, and that it's necessary to be in compliance to preserve the health of the fishery, the Secretary is obligated by law to impose a moratorium on the fishery. And that is a big deal for Virginia. If it happens, no one in the state may land or possess uh, fish of the relevant species, in other words, Manhattan. Um, that would definitely include fish Manhattan that you capture, you ca catch in Virginia waters. But uh, as I'll show you in a minute, it also is likely to include the further restriction that you can't possess fish. In other words, if this happens, Omega would not be able to go out into federal waters and take in a harvest of Manhattan and bring it to a refill to process it. So a Manhattan, I mean a Manhattan moratorium would have a very significant deleterious effect on the fishery, on the jobs associated with the fishery, on the economic spin-offs from that fishery, such as even the blue crab fishery, they wouldn't be able to get um, uh, Manhattan. So, and then there's civil penalties, criminal penalties, and so forth. But the shutting down of the fishery itself is a very big deal. So, how do we think Virginia is going to act? You know, we can all speculate, and there's a lot of basis for speculation based on what people say, but let's look a little bit at what has done, has been done historically. You remember, this is a, this started off as a voluntary compact. The compact <coughs> says that this compact shall remain in force and binding upon the states until renounced by it. Can Virginia withdraw? Well, Virginia uh, actually began the process in the middle of the 90s to withdraw from the compact. Uh, it did so by enacting legislation that would repeal the compact, which is part of Virginia code, effective at a certain period of time in the future. It never took effect because the next year, before it was supposed to take effect, the General Assembly delayed it, and then the year after they repealed it. Um, so, don't know whether they'll try that again, but uh, it was not successful the last time. Um, this is an example of what Virginia has done with respect to another fishery, the horseshoe crab fishery. Virginia was not in compliance with the management plan that pertained to horseshoe crabs. And so, in October of 2000, the Secretary of Commerce said, moratorium, you can, nobody in Virginia can land, process, fish in Virginia waters, or, and here's where the Secretary used its authority to say, you can't even possess any horseshoe crabs that you catch anywhere and bring them to Virginia waters. And it did so saying, well look, if we didn't, if, if we didn't make the moratorium as broad as we could, then Vir Virginia would just be able to get around that by fishing in federal waters. So there's a history for having a really broad moratorium. And in fact, you'll see the dates here. The moratorium in that instance was canceled within two weeks because Virginia came into compliance. Now, notice the difference here. They came into compliance in two weeks, relatively easy to do because the horseshoe crab industry is regulated by VMRC, and VMRC has the ability to promulgate regulations on an emergency basis relatively quickly. But recall, Manhattan is managed by the General Assembly, and recall that the General Assembly only meets once a year, basically, unless there's a special session. So, they turned around really quickly there, but query whether that could happen with respect to Manhattan. Um, okay, one last hi historical note. Um, in 2006, uh, Virginia was very unhappy with what uh, the ASMFC tried to do in imposing a change through amendment, uh, through uh, addenda. Then Attorney General Bob McDonald at the request of Senator Chichester, wrote uh, an, uh, an attorney general opinion 
saying, in effect, and I, and I mean this, I, I don't mean any disrespect here, he said, we don't have to abide by this in his legal uh, document. He said the reason is that coming up with his addendum, Virgin the, the commission did not follow its own rules on a, a matter of procedure. We can say that because we look at those rules. And even though usually the agency's own interpretation of its rules governs, we don't have to abide by what the agency said its rules mean because, well, the reason is the consequences are so severe, moratorium, they are coercive, and they effectively um, bring to bear, the, they, they threaten states' rights or um, amendment uh, or actions that are prohibited by the 10th Amendment. So for all these reasons, we can safely ignore what the Commission told us that we had to do, uh, and, and it's a, just a recommendation, not a requirement. Okay. Yeah. No surprise, the Commission did not agree with uh, that interpretation of the law and said, look, if you look at how the Commission's powers are um, reflected in other interstate compacts, how the courts have looked at what interstate compacts, uh, how they act, <coughs> You can't say, Virginia does not have the right to come up with its own interpretation of the rules. It's got to abide by what we say that they mean. <clears throat> Moreover, if you go back to the very beginning document, the charter of ASMFC, it says member states like Virginia are responsible for full and effective enforcement of the management plan. Virginia, you've got to do this. In response to the idea that you know Virginia was poor and unfortunate and being led around the nose by all these other states, poor, woe is us, Virginia, the commission said, look, there are a whole series of ways that you have to let your voice be heard, to bring to bear new evidence, to persuade your member states. You, you basically, you can't just, you know, take your ball and go home. You're part of this process. Uh, even if you don't like all of the results. And finally, it said, as to the constitutional argument, the argument that there's a Tenth Amendment, states rights, reason for us not to have to comply, the court said, okay, think about this. Congress has adopted a federal act that we talked about earlier, and in our view, Congress is fully empowered under the Constitution to do that act. Why? Because the act regulates interstate commerce in Manhattan. We saw the interstate aspect of it. It's plainly commerce, and commerce can be regulated under the Constitution's Commerce Clause. So, what we had there in that instance was lawyer for the state saying X, lawyer for ASMFC saying Y. Neither one ultimately you know, came to a decision. It didn't go to court. What resulted was a longer term negotiation, and ultimately Virginia came into compliance. So, is that going to happen here? We don't know. I couldn't resist this particular cartoon. I know it's sometimes hard to read these on a PowerPoint, so I will just tell you, yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we create a lot of value for shareholders. <laughs> so, I, I submit to you, there's an aspect of that that pertains uh, here, uh, and it, it, it will be our responsibility, and I hope you will join in this, to uh, help the legislators in the General Assembly realize that their responsibilities are uh, manifest here. They need to preserve the fishery by uh, following the advice of the scientists who have been working hard to bring to bear the best available science to sustain the fishery. Do not, if you have the opportunity, allow the idea to um, be stated that, that we're working to close the fishery. We're working to sustain, the Bay Foundation believes that it's important to sustain the fishery. It's important for Bay health. It's important for the livelihoods of those who use the fishery. And it's important, to say the obvious, to ensure that that continues for our children and our grandchildren. So uh, I would just close with this. We, we are going to ask the legislators to adopt, implement, and enforce what we, um, 
are looking for, forward to coming out of the meeting of the SMC on December 14. Um, we suggest, that should say use, we suggest that Virginia should use uh, the ASMFC's procedures to resolve its disputes and come to an agreement uh, and then to recognize that, in fact, Virginia gets a lot of benefits from the component from, from ASMFC's jurisdictional reach. It gets, it assures that all the states and all the fishing industries and their citizens equitably share not only the benefits of this fishery, um, but also in, in the long-term environmental um, rewards of a, of a thriving fishery. So thank you for